I want to welcome you to this panel discussion on the geopolitics of Kaliningrad, which is hosted by the Centre for Geopolitics at the University of Cambridge. I want to thank Professor Brendan Sims, the Director of the Centre for Geopolitics, and his colleagues at the Centre for their help and support in organising this event. This is the next in our Baltic Geopolitical Programme series and the first of the 2022-23 academic year, which is our second full year of activity. Our next online event will be on November the 2nd, addressing changing international alignments in Sweden, Denmark and Finland from 1945 to 2022, obviously about those aspects of the Western Baltic, Western Baltic geopolitics, uh, which are highly relevant today. And other than that, we have some upcoming in-person events in Cambridge and in Warsaw. There's been a great deal of interest in this series, and I'm delighted to say that with our colleagues in the network of universities in the region, we are now building a substantial program of events and activities, and also a regular newsletter. If you're watching this and you haven't yet done so, please sign up to receive our regular material. 102 people have registered for this event. I don't expect as many as that to actually join, but I'm delighted at the level of interest. This is an online video panel. We will end at 18.30 UK time promptly. I will moderate a discussion with the panelists for the first half hour. And then in the second half of the discussion, I will relay questions from the audience to our panelists. You as the audience will be able to see and hear me and the panelists. You will have your microphone and camera switched off automatically so that at no time will you be heard or seen by anyone in the webinar. However, you are still able to communicate with me and the panelists. At the bottom of your screen, there is a Q&A, a question and answer option. And uh, uh, if you wish to type it, click on it, and when it opens, you have the chance to type questions. If you do type questions, please start by writing your name and your affiliation first. If your question is for a specific panelist, please state that at the outset as well. I will try, try to cover as many of your questions as possible. Although in view of these numbers and time constraints, we might not be able to address everyone's questions. Finally, I also want to let you know that this video panel is being recorded and we will post the recording on our website over the next few days so people can watch at other times. As I said, the title of this event is The Geopolitics of Kaliningrad. The proposition is that the Baltic Sea region is now more geopolitically unified than it's ever been in its history. Kaliningrad, together with the Russian coast of the Gulf of Finland, are the only areas outside of the NATO alliance following the Swedish and Finnish decisions. As a result of recent Russian aggression, Kaliningrad has become central to the geopolitics of the Baltic Sea region. And in response to the accession of Sweden and Finland, Russia threatened to openly place nuclear missiles, which are probably already there, in the exclave. While Lithuania seemed to impose and then lift restrictions on Russian transit to Kaliningrad across its territory. The significance of the Suwalki Gap, the stretch of Polish-Lithuanian border between Kaliningrad and Belarus, that is the Baltic state's only land border to the rest of NATO, has risen with the Russian invasion of Ukraine and of course with the worries about what appears to be happening at this very moment in Russia in response to those circumstances. This event is bringing together historians and policymakers to consider the longer history and wider context of the Kaliningrad exclave. What were the key considerations around the creation of the exclave in the aftermath of the Second World War? How did Kaliningrad change and shift after the collapse of the Soviet Union? And how has its role changed since? How does the changing geopolitics of the Baltic impact how we understand Kaliningrad and what its future holds? We have an excellent panel of four people to discuss this, and the panelists will each present for seven to 10 minutes and will be followed by questions and answers to the panel from myself and participants. I will moderate this event. I should have said my name is Charles Clark. I'm the co-leader of the Baltic Geopolitics Programme. 
Two of our panelists you can see in front of us, Carol Piramai and Professor Stefan Wolf, Professor Carol Piramai and Professor Stefan Wolf, and I'll enjoy them, introduce them all in a bit more detail in a moment. Our third panelist is Raimundus Lupata, who is a member of the Lithuanian Parliament, and he is intending to join us but he said that he was slightly hanging on events within the Lithuanian parliament itself, whether he's in committee meetings or not. So I hope he will indeed join us, but there's a little uncertainty. And our fourth panel panelist is Sir Stuart Peach, the former chief of the defence staff and chairman of the military committee of NATO, to give us an insight on the military implications of this. Uh, however, he's texted this morning, to say the former chief of the UK defence staff, the most senior military officer in the British uh, defences. He's been involved in the funeral of the Queen and the mourning period and has had to host many, many visitors uh, to London in these last two days. It's been very fluid for him, so he says he cannot join the event until rather later in our uh, session. So I'm sorry that he'll be joining late and that we haven't yet got the link in from Raimundus Lapata. But we'll kick off with uh, Dr. Karel Piramai, Professor Karel Piramai, who's an Associate Professor of Contemporary History at the University of Tartu, and also the author of Roosevelt, Churchill and the Baltic Question, which addresses these questions of what happened at the end of the Second World War and where we are. I'm going to ask him uh, to talk about the history of Konigsberg, Kaliningrad, what happened in 1944-56, Königsberg, as you know, was previously the easternmost large city in Germany until World War II and the home of the philosopher Immanuel Kant. After the German defeat in the war, how did Kaliningrad get formed? What is it, what is it about? What did the great powers think about it? Carol, uh, we're very much looking forward to your discussion of what really happened at this time. Why is Kaliningrad what it is? Hello from me. Uh, thank you very much, Charles, for this uh, uh, opportunity. Uh, I did write about the Baltic question, and of course, uh, uh, Königsberg uh, is, is, is related in, in as much as it, it um, concerns the change of borders and, and uh, uh, the, the creation of the Soviet sphere of influence. Uh, after the Second World War, but I did not uh, directly res research this question, and it's still, uh, I think, uh, clouded in, in some mystery uh, why Stalin uh, thought it necessary to an annex the, the province, but using some uh, literature on that, not my own research, I will try to uh, give some background and, and perhaps uh, give some answers. Uh, so uh, there were several uh, uh, processes uh, that uh, led to that. Uh, uh, as you know, uh, uh, and uh, particularly, I, 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 would, I would recommend the, the book by Chris Clark, uh, uh, his book, Iron Kingdom. And he, he reminds us that uh, the only country that uh, disappeared from the map of Europe as a, as a result of the Second World War was, was Prussia. And of course, uh, Königsberg and the territories of East Prussia were uh, an historic and important part of, of, of that uh, country. So, so why did uh, Prussia disappear? Why was it wiped out? Uh, during the war, uh, the Allies, the Western Allies, first of all, came to the uh, decision that uh, in order to wipe out German militarism, uh, Prussia has to be wiped out too. And, and of course, anti-Prussianism has a, had a long history uh, since uh, at least the First World War, Prussia had been uh, depicted as, as uh, partly modernized, but still essentially ar archaic and anachronistic uh, entity. And, and actually uh, this anticipated and indeed inspired the Sonderweg thesis 
that became so dominant in German historical writing in the 1960s and, and 70s. And even many German uh, emigres in the 1930s began to regard Hitler as uh, the arch Prussian, uh, for quite forgetting that uh, the, uh, Hitler's background as, as an Austrian. And so too the allied leaders, for example, uh, the British Foreign Secretary Anton Eden said in December 39 that Hitler was just the latest expression of Russian military domination. And Ernst Bevin, uh, the labor, li labor leader, uh, said in uh, 41 that in order to get rid of German militarism, one had to uh, get rid of the terrible philosophy of Prussianism. Uh, and Churchill told the British Parliament in 43 that the core of Germany is Prussia. Uh, so this must be uh, wiped out. And, and the United States uh, took a similar view. President Roosevelt telling the Congress that the war breeding gang of Russian militarists must be rooted out along, alongside the Nazis. Uh, uh, Stalin and the Soviet Union had actually a more nuanced view of the matter. Moscow knew uh, about the differences between the Prussian aristocratic elites and Nazis. And for example, when the July 44 plot against Hitler happened, Soviet propaganda uh, began to glorify the instigators of the plot uh, associated with uh, Klaus von Stauffenberg primarily, but there were others as well. And of course, uh, Soviet pro propaganda could also uh, re refer back to the um, German-Prussian uh, uh, cooperation uh, against Napoleon in, in uh, early uh, 19th century. So uh, Chris Clark suggests that Stalin hesitated about destroying Prussia completely, but I don't think there is much evidence about it. Already in uh, a Tehran conf conference in 43, Stalin asked uh, his allies for an ice-free port uh, on the Baltic Sea and saying that, you know, Königsberg and Memel uh, uh, could be used for that. Uh, and also insisted that uh, East Russia was historic, uh, historically uh, Slavic territory, which was not true, at, uh, of course. Uh, there was no agreement at, at that stage, but uh, Soviet uh, Stalin actually started to solve the problem uh, unilaterally. So there was a treaty between uh, communist Poland and Soviet Union already in, in July 44, assigning uh, Königsberg and the uh, territories around it to the Soviet Union. In fact, to the yeah to the Soviet Union. Later, it was assigned to the. Russian Federation and Danzig and, and territories uh, surrounding Danzig to Poland. But the territory was still under, under German control. It had to be uh, uh, occupied militarily. And this was a really difficult uh, task because although the Germans were losing the war, they defended their own territory uh, 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 fiercely. Uh, so the uh, first time uh, the Soviet army uh, entered uh, German territory was actually in East Prussia and uh, the Russian soldiers acted as, as the famous propagandist Ilya Ehrenburg. Ehrenburg had declared, I quote, we shall kill if you have not killed at least one German a day, you have wasted that day. If you kill one German, killed another, there is nothing funnier for us than a pile of German corpses. Uh, historians have also suggested that uh, uh, part of the answer why the Soviet army was so acted so uh, gruesomely was that uh, was the German uh, heavy resistance. Uh, so uh, that that made the uh, uh, Soviet soldiers uh, mm, angry. But of course, there was the uh, uh, will to reven for revenge. 
so during this, I don't know, go into the, I will not go into details. Uh, uh, it's important that uh, the city of Königsberg and the surroundings was uh, almost completely destroyed in, in, in the fighting uh, for the town. Uh, the town actually held out until April. Uh, uh, 150,000 Soviet soldiers uh, uh, took part in the battle for Königsberg. There were heavy losses and so on and so forth. But in fact, actually, the Allied, uh, there was also an Allied bombing raid already in August 44 that had destroyed part of the old town. Uh, finally, Königsberg capitulated. Uh, the town was plundered. Many houses were burnt even after uh, the battles had ended. Women raped, many people killed, and so on. Uh, so and uh, and Stalin uh, started to annex the territory to the Russian Federation in practice immediately after the war ended, uh, and the uh, Allied conference at Potsdam in July and August uh, only ratified it after the event actually, and again Stalin claimed that uh, uh, Russia needed. Uh, and he, he emphasized that Russians needed compensation because Russians had shed so much blood in the war. And I, I actually believe that uh, uh, this consideration was quite important uh, for Stalin. He wanted to compensate the Russians. Uh, so he gave uh, Königsberg to Russia, Russia, where it is today. Uh, the other, other con consideration was to create uh, a strong Poland uh, so Poland received uh, part of East Russia and also territories uh, in, in uh, uh, Pomerania and elsewhere, so that uh, Poland would be uh, would depend uh, on the protection of uh, Soviet Union, so become become a satellite of uh, the Soviet Union, uh, and indeed uh, it was uh, it, it it succeeded in the beginning. Uh, uh, there was also the uh, general idea, as Stalin said to the Serb communist uh, Milovan Dilas, that this war is different. Whoever occupies the territory also imposes his own social system. So Stalin uh, 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 abolished uh, uh, the uh, Junkers class that uh, also the Western allies thought was the uh, root problem of uh, German militarism. Uh, so all uh, uh, landowners were, um, their properties were confiscated and so on. Uh, and eventually uh, also all the Germans who remained there, there were 100,000 uh, Germans still in, in Königsberg after the war, uh, they were deported uh, two years later, uh, but again, historians uh, think, suggest that this was initially not in the plans of Stalin. He probably wanted to uh, 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 integrate into a new communist society, uh, but eventually uh, decided to deport them to, to East, uh, East Germany. And the reason uh, may be that uh, there was a large influx of uh, people from elsewhere from the Soviet Union. They expected to uh, raise their living standards. They thought this was a Western, uh, this was almost Europe. But when they came there, they found out that the city had been destroyed. There was very little uh, uh, living. Uh, few houses to, to live and so on uh, and eventually uh, there was just no no room for those hundred thousand germans and uh, moscow also didn't care uh, that uh, uh, actually uh, Königsberg or already kaliningrad at the time because the name was changed to kaliningrad in, in 46 that actually kaliningrad would have needed that uh, workforce uh, but the influx of new people was uh, quite massive. So 2,000 uh, 
200,000 people came only in, in uh, 46, but uh, uh, almost uh, one third of those people uh, left again, uh, went back home by 1950. So uh, this, uh, it took uh, four, four, uh, 40 years uh, for the Soviet Union uh, to, for Kaliningrad uh, to uh, uh, have the same uh, population that was before the war. Uh, so before the war, uh, mm, Kaliningrad, Königsberg had uh, slightly less than 400,000 people and it would take Kaliningrad 40 years to surpass this figure. Clearly, uh, German East Prussia uh, ceased to exist. exist. Uh, the city remained in ruins for many years after the war. In uh, 51, a Soviet visitor noted, Königsberg does not exist for kilometers in every di direction, an unforgettable landscape of ruins. The old city is dead. Uh, so why so? Why, why did the city remain in ruins for, for decades? Uh, those German uh, uh, remnants of German architecture were viewed with suspicion as representative of an alien social system. Uh, the first city architect, Dimitri Nova, uh, Tim, uh, that's not important. The first, first city architect actually wanted to model the city uh, as a new uh, Moscow, as a, as, a, as a copy, a smaller copy of Moscow. Uh, uh, there was the question, for example, what to do with the remnants of the famous uh, Königsberg Castle and uh, uh, local people, uh, a lot of local people actually wanted to uh, maintain that castle. And during uh, Rushov's time, people began to argue that uh, this would give uh, the city some kind of a unique character. But when Brezhnev uh, mm, came to power in, in 64, uh, he, uh, it is uh, said that he personally intervened and ordered the castle to be destroyed. So uh, because it was a, a military base, it was uh, close to visitors. So uh, in German uh, imagination, uh, it was like a, like a, a German Atlantis uh, no one knew what was going on there. A uh, few people had visited it. Uh, it was like a lost city on the Baltic, and it was open to visitors only in uh, 1987. Uh, and uh, uh, it, it was, of course, interesting to, to see what, what uh, remnants of Germanness uh, what was still there. Uh, today, there is uh, still the Königsberg Cathedral, which has been restored by the Russians, and even a, a Königsberg uh, synagogue. There is also a church uh, that is uh, 800 years old, a stock exchange and seven former medieval city gates. Uh, the monument for Immanuel Kant was, was destroyed in 45, but uh, uh, restored in uh, 92 by uh, the efforts of Mar 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 uh, Marion Dönhoff, uh, who was native of Königsberg and later a famous uh, West German publisher of the journal Die Zeit. So that's, uh, I would end here. Thanks. Carol, thank you so much. Uh, you've given a very uh, both detailed and colorful explanation of how Kaliningrad has ended up where it is. Um, I'll leave it to further questions uh, in a moment and go straight to Professor Stefan Wolf. Uh, Stefan is the Professor of International Security at the Department of Political Science and International Studies at the University of Birmingham. He's done a great deal of work academically in his past on the uh, politics and history of the eastern part of Germany and of Prussia. Stefan, you're going to talk mainly today 
about Kaliningrad's current geopolitical significance, the current situation, recent events with the EU and Lithuania and where it should go. And I'm very much looking forward to that. But if you had any comments to add to what Carol has said about how Kaliningrad has developed since 1945, and particular since 1991, including attitudes within Kaliningrad itself, if you had any observations on that to build on what Carol has said, we'd very much appreciate them. Those were the points that we were hoping to discuss with Raimundus, who's obviously got stuck in the Lithuanian parliament. So if you did have any comments on that, we'd very much welcome them. Uh, but as I say, the main uh, thing we'll welcome from your contribution is on the current geopolitical significance of Kaliningrad and recent events within the EU and Lithuania and where it would go. So Professor Stefan Wolf, we very much look, look forward to hearing what you have to say. Thank you very much, uh, Charles, and thank you very much to the Center of Geopolitics uh, for giving me a platform here um, to, to talk about these issues. Uh, I, I think I have to um, delay any comments uh, on what Carl has said and sort of the period between where he finished and where I'll start. Uh, maybe until the discussion, I just need to wrap my head around um, this a little bit more. I have some initial um, thoughts, but I'll, I'll leave them for a little later. Um, so what, what you asked me to do um, uh, in my own uh, presentation is uh, to reflect on how the changing geopolitics of the Baltic impacts uh, on how we understand uh, Kaliningrad uh, today. And I want to emphasize here the uh, today part uh, of that, um, because that also lets me a little bit off the hook, uh, uh, I think, uh, in terms of um, having to offer you a similarly uh, detailed uh, and um, if I may say magisterial presentation compared to the one that uh, Carl did, because you know talking about uh, the present, let alone the future, uh, is always um, much more prone to speculation um, and far less uh, grounded uh, in the detailed historical records that we um, can now examine. Uh, so let me uh, share a few um, brief thoughts um, with you on where and how I see uh, the geopolitics of the Baltics uh, uh, today. Um, I think it's very clear that uh, Kaliningrad is for sure a leverage uh, point that um, Russia um, has, um, can use, and to some extent uh, has used, uh, primarily against uh, Lithuania and uh, Putin. Um, but we should also not forget in this uh, broader context uh, of uh, the geopolitical setting in the, in the Baltics, um, that Putin of course also has um, a degree of leverage uh, with potentially pro-Russian, um, ethnic Russian minorities in Estonia and Latvia. And I think it's really important here to um, clarify that not every, ethnic Russian in these countries is pro-Russia. Um, so I th think that's a really important distinction to make because otherwise um, I think we would very easily fall into a rather gloomy view of the future uh, of these two um, important NATO and EU uh, allies, given the sheer size of the um, uh, ethnic Russian uh, and Russian speaking communities, uh, if you want, in these two uh, countries. Uh, so I think there is leverage uh, there that Putin has. There's also leverage uh, in uh, Kaliningrad. Um, and of course, the other uh, important piece of the geopolitical uh, context uh, that you referred to um, in your introductory remarks, Charles, is the fact that we now have the uh, potential, and I would still say quite likely uh, accession of Sweden and uh, Finland uh, to NATO. Uh, obviously there's a little bit of uncertainty um, given uh, uh, the Turkish position uh, on that. Uh, but even if that were delayed um, uh, significantly, um, what is very obvious I think now is that it clearly has changed the overall geopolitical dynamic uh, in the Baltic. Uh, which is now uh, 
almost, um, you could say, uh, inter internal territorial waters uh, of um, NATO and the uh, EU, save uh, uh, those parts of the, uh, of the Russian coastline and uh, Kaliningrad. Um, so I think from, from that perspective, uh, Kaliningrad, probably from a Russian perspective, now um, acquires even more importance uh, because it is what uh, has been referred to quite frequently in the past, uh, almost like an unsinkable aircraft carrier um, that Russia uh, has uh, in the middle of um, what is now clearly um, a NATO uh, area uh, to, to an extent. Um, and there's, of course, um, um, all kinds of risks uh, associated with that. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a little um, while. I also think that if we are talking uh, about geopolitics and if we are serious uh, in that, I think we have to look uh, beyond uh, uh, the Baltic. Um, so in that sense, I mean, geopolitics really is almost a, a more global uh, endeavor, um, if you want. Um, and I think here, um, a couple of uh, issues need to be uh, considered. Obviously, we have the situation in Ukraine, which is uh, still evolving um, at a very rapid um, pace. Uh, and one of the reasons why we are talking again about uh, Kaliningrad, including in a geopolitical sense, obviously has to do uh, with the situation in Ukraine. It did so uh, uh, certainly uh, for the past six months of uh, Putin's uh, adventure uh, there. But I think even more so uh, now when uh, there is Again, a very serious discussion uh, in Russia now about holding uh, referenda in the newly occupied uh, uh, territories uh, of Ukraine, presumably between the 23rd and 27th um, of September. Um, and a very clear indication uh, from uh, senior Russian sources, including uh, past President Medvedev, who is now deputy chairman of the um, Security Council of the Russian uh, Federation, that once these territories are part of Russia, um, any kind of attack on them would require a Russian response uh, along the lines of um, the self-defense uh, article in uh, the uh, UN Charter. That of course, I think uh, we all would agree would be a major escalation, but also it would allow Russia actually to upgrade uh, what is uh, still uh, in Putin's words, uh, only a special military operation uh, to a full-scale war and would allow him um, to uh, call for a general mobilization uh, in Russia. So I think all of this needs to be uh, factored in when we are thinking about uh, Kaliningrad uh, also as potentially military, military uh, leverage that Putin has uh, in uh, what he now very much uh, seems to see as a civilizational uh, struggle or confrontation uh, with the West. Um, another important piece of uh, uh, geopolitics that unfolded um, last uh, week uh, was the meeting of the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization uh, in Samarkand in uh, Uzbekistan. Um, and arguably even more significant from, from the point of the discussion that, that we have had uh, here was um, a prior visit of uh, President Xi uh, uh, to Kazakhstan uh, uh, the day before. Now, Xi made it very clear that China uh, stood four square uh, behind uh, Kazakhstan's uh, territorial integrity and, and sovereignty. Um, and this is again important uh, from the perspective that there had been some saber rattling uh, in uh, Russia uh, over the summer, uh, especially after the Kazakh president um, uh, at the St. Petersburg Economic Forum said that there was no way that uh, Kazakhstan would recognize uh, the independence um, as Russia had done uh, of the self-declared uh, republics um, in uh, Ukraine, uh, Donetsk and Lugansk people's republics, uh, so-called. Um, so now Xi um, very strongly uh, sign signaling to Russia that uh, uh, China um, would arguably not tolerate um, a use of uh, heavily populated uh, Russian territories uh, in Northern Kazakhstan 
for any plans that um, the Kremlin might have to restore some mini Soviet Union. I think that's very important uh, uh, for Kazakhstan and for Central Asia, but it's also important in what Xi did not say. Uh, so he did not make any similar statements uh, uh, in relation uh, to Ukraine. Uh, China has not recognized um, either the annexation of Crimea uh, in 2014 or Russia's recognition of the um, self-declared independence of the People's Republics. Um, but nonetheless, I think uh, Xi's uh, si silence um, uh, on territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine, I think is also important in um, one interpretation, um, because you could say it um, did give Putin uh, some more uh, leeway, uh, if you want, uh, a little bit more rope uh, uh, to actually uh, press ahead with uh, creating um, a new uh, status quo. And this again then links uh, to uh, the question of um, uh, Kaliningrad, because as uh, Karl said uh, uh, very early on uh, in his presentation, there always has been uh, uh, a Russian or Soviet view that once you actually control territory, it's very hard uh, to undo uh, that control. Um, and that arguably uh, uh, was behind um, uh, Stalin's uh, thinking in terms of the territorial changes um, that happened uh, sort of between the Yalta and Potsdam uh, conferences. Um, also important uh, in terms of what happened um, uh, in relation to uh, events uh, in the Balkans uh, at the time that were also fought very much over um, territorial control. And once you are there, you hold the territory and, you know, 90% of the law is uh, possession um, in that sense. Um, so where then does that leave us in terms of uh, the significance of uh, uh, Kaliningrad? Um, I think um, in my own view, it is still unlikely that Putin um, really is spoiling for an open confrontation uh, uh, with NATO. Um, but clearly Putin does have leverage uh, through uh, uh, Kaliningrad um, and through uh, Estonia and uh, Latvia. Um, but you can turn this around and you can say, well, it also opens him up uh, to pressure uh, from the West. Um, so, I mean, certainly um, as we have seen uh, with the developments um, in relation to Lith some, of Lith some of Lithuania's uh, uh, moves, um, in terms of potentially cutting off uh, uh, Kaliningrad from um, uh, certainly supply uh, by Russia uh, over land uh, uh, through Belarus. Um, I mean, that's a, a potential um, uh, problem uh, uh, for Putin in particular, also given that um, the uh, Baltic now is becoming more and more um, NATO uh, uh, territory with um, uh, the likelihood of uh, Finland's and Sweden's um, accession. Um, nonetheless, I, I think putting pressure uh, on Kaliningrad or using Kaliningrad as um, uh, leverage uh, by Putin, I think um, uh, is dangerous. It's, it's dangerous uh, um, from a Western perspective, it's dangerous uh, uh, from a, a Russian perspective. So both sides, I think, will need to handle this quite carefully in order to avoid an undesirable and uh, unintended um, escalation. So to come back uh, to the internet in initial question that you asked me about how the changing geopolitics of the Baltic impacts on how we understand uh, uh, Kaliningrad, my answer to that would be that um, um, we have to look at Kaliningrad quite seriously. Um, as a potential uh, trigger point uh, for an even greater disaster um, than we already have in Europe at the moment. And on that cheerful note, um, I hand back over to you, Charles. Thank you. Seven, thank you so much. That was really tremendous. Uh, we've had two tremendous um, presentations, I'm sure you'll agree. Um, I'm going to come back with a couple of questions to you, but just to remind you, if you have Q&A that you'd like to ask, just hit the Q&A button. We've had a couple of questions already coming in. One is on the military situation, which I'm going to hold 
until hopefully Stuart Peach arrives later on. But the second relates directly to the history, Carl, which you were describing earlier. It's from Dr. Darius Fermanavicius, the author of the monograph, Lithuania Rejoins Europe. And he says, it may have been wise to demand that Russia withdraw all its military and security forces from the occupied area as they withdrew from Denmark in the 1940s or Austria in the 1950s or the Baltic states, Poland and Germany in the 1990s. Why was the West, in your opinion, Karl, unable or unwilling to demand Russia withdraw from East Prussia uh, after the war at that point? Why is it that the, the West didn't press for that solution, a kind of demilitarized zone or neutral type zone or buffer state type question, rather than being part of the Soviet Union uh, and Russia? Karl, I very much welcome any comments you've had on Darius's question. Thank you very much for the uh, for this interesting question. It's it will forever will be debated why why did it why the war ended like it did. Uh, but uh, sometimes uh, just uh, people don't realize that uh, the Western Allies had so little leverage uh, that they they had they were not in a in a in a position to to just uh, ask or demand uh, these things uh, because they, they wanted uh, uh, a lot of things from Stalin in the first place. The, most of the fighting against uh, Germany was in fact done by, by the Russian, uh, with the, that's not Russian only, but the Soviet soldiers, Ukrainians. We, don't, we, don't, we must not uh, forget Ukrainians and other uh, nationalities in the Soviet Union, but the fact was that most of the fighting uh, was done by the Red Army, the Soviet Army. And uh, Stalin, uh, by the way, actually kept his promises. So, for example, uh, when there was the Operation Overlord in '44, the Allied operation, Western Allies operation, then uh, Stalin uh, started his operation in Belarus, the op op Operation Bagration. And he kept, for example, his promise to invade uh, Japan, uh, also uh, in, in, in later in, in, uh, in, in August uh, 45. Uh, so Stalin actually kept his promises. Of course, uh, he uh, installed uh, communists in power in East, 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 Eastern Europe and so on. Uh, but at the same time, he uh, allowed Churchill to suppress the communist uprising in Greece in 44. Uh, so, and Churchill uh, concluded that uh, Stalin can be trusted, that you know, he, he uh, the sphere of influence uh, agreement that he, that he uh, agreed upon with, with, uh, with Stalin, uh, uh, is, is, um, uh, is working. Uh, and and there was no no uh, way to uh, eject the Soviet army from from these territories. Poland was uh, on the path, uh, on the direct path uh, towards Berlin, so Poland was uh, uh, had to be uh, occupied before uh, the Soviet army could uh, actually. Uh, uh, Make the final push towards Berlin, and and Königsberg uh, was also on that way. So Königsberg had to be occupied as well, and of course, and there were many other issues like uh, um, uh, the United States wanting to establish the United Nations. Uh, Roosevelt wanted uh, Soviet cooperation on that point. Uh, Stalin actually agreed to. Uh, established the United Nations, become the founding member, and so on and so forth. So it, it is really a difficult uh, question. Carol, thank you very much. Stuart, we're delighted that you've been able to join us. And can I firstly say thank you? I know you've been very busy representing the government during the mourning period uh, and around the events of uh, the, sad, the sad death of the Queen. 
And we very much appreciate your uh, readiness to keep the commitment to join this group, even though I know it's been a bit of a rush. Um, and thank you very much for doing so. Um, what we've had before you arrived is Professor Karol Pirimai talking about the history of Konigsberg, Kaliningrad, what happened. Very, very interesting and full talk. And then Professor Stefan Wolf, a professor at the University of Birmingham, trying to assess Kaliningrad's current geopolitical significance, uh, recent events with the EU and Lithuania and where it should go. Unfortunately, Raimundus Lepata, who's a historian of, Kal of Kaliningrad, a member of the Lithuanian parliament, I think has been caught in the parliament in Vilnius and it doesn't seem to be able to join us, which we're sorry about. But we're delighted, Stuart, that you've been ready to come and join our group today. Um, Stuart is a former chief of the defense staff and chairman of the military committee of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. Um, he has immense military experience, knowledge and understanding. And I'm hoping, uh, Stuart, that you can give us uh, seven or 10 minutes on the military challenges which arise for us all from the geopolitical situation uh, of Kaliningrad, including the Suwalki Gap, the you know, very short um, line of uh, communication between the Baltic states and the rest of NATO. And I'd very much welcome any um, introduction you could make. I should say we've got Q&A and a couple of questions already come in on the military situation, which I'll bring come to you after your presentation. But I'd be very grateful, Stuart, if you could kick off how difficult is the military situation that arises from the geopolitical situation arising around Kaliningrad. Uh, thank you, Charles. And uh, hello, everybody. And I've been extremely generously introduced by the chair. And of course, this is not a new issue. And I think your the previous speaker, Karel, made that very clear. And I would argue that now more than ever, this year more than ever, we've seen in the, the raw, the, the raw behavior of Russia, many continuities with the Russian Empire, the Soviet time and beyond. And the continuities often are uh, neglected by the geography. In this case, we're talking about the geography to the Northwest of Russia itself. But of course, many of the continuities apply equally to the Russian attitude to Georgia, to the Caucasus, to the Black Sea, to the, to the Russia East, uh, or indeed their ongoing disputes with Japan. So in other words, I think there are many continuities in Russian policy, which stand both the test of time and indeed, if I can use this phrase, the change of regime. And that continuity, I think is going to be stretched over the next few days even, as we see an announcement in the last few minutes of referenda times maybe four, so it's not quite clear yet, in those occupied territories in Ukraine, which of course sets many of you and following the region, following the conflict, following indeed the, the consequences, that sets some new challenges because one of the other things that I think is common to both the period of the Russian Empire and more recent events under President Putin is this concept of Russification, where places and peoples are made Russian to suit the geostrategic political purpose of the Russian state, empire, Soviet Union in its various guises. And of course, Kaliningrad was exactly that uh, many decades ago. And I was struck by Carol, your analysis of that period in 44, 45, where the chess pieces were moving rapidly and indeed, some of the some of the manoeuvres were more thought through, perhaps, than others. And then I'm also struck, as I get older and listen to my friends in your region and beyond, how many consequences there were of both world wars in terms of the whole scale movement of peoples. And of course, one of the second thoughts is that that whole scale movement of peoples leaves minorities of various types various ethnic groups stranded. And that then gives future opportunities for either Russian meddling or Russian uh, bad behavior. And one of the phrases I 
I will just use and uh, be happy to be shot down by professional academics, which I'm not, is that Russia is a peaceful country surrounded by ceasefires. And this sense of creating a periphery with op options for future developments, with options for possibly technology, possibly maritime adventures. And I would add in this strategic context, noting that the, the center is about geopolitics, that a very similar approach to Russian basing in Syria. And I think the czars would have been entirely comfortable with Putin's attempt to create a naval base and an air base in Syria for the medium and long term, thereby gaining that sort of access to warm water. Similarly, in Kaliningrad, you see that Baltic approach. And yet, despite the history, despite the Russification, despite the continuity in Russian behavior, I would argue that Russia is continuing to fail to meet its strategic objectives, that it's set itself. And furthermore, and much more important to an audience like this, many of us for many years have wondered and indeed worried perhaps, but wondered about the true competence and consequence of the Russian military machine. And I think that's now a very significant issue for debate. Of course, truth is the first casualty of war and finding out exactly what's going on in the Russian armed forces, I think now is quite a devil of a, uh, of a job. But nonetheless, this has not gone well. And therefore we have to think about the geostrategic consequences for that, whether it's the sort of equipment that lies already in Kaliningrad or whether it's the sort of readiness that that equipment and those people have and, uh, and then a third factor in all forms of warfare, uh, a British historian called John Keegan, who I knew very well, famously said, an army without discipline is a crowd. And I think the morale factors and the unit level morale issues and tactical issues in the, the Russian army are now a significant issue to be studied and reflected upon. So I don't think there's much new in Russian behavior, threats and style, but I do think we're entering a dangerous time and phase. And so all my time in NATO, and I'm a friend of the region, I've been to all the countries, I'm not allowed obviously as the military head of NATO to visit Kaliningrad, but I've been everywhere else in the region. And I continue to encourage defense investment. I continue to encourage forces that interoperate. And one of the great strengths of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is its convening authority to bring countries together and for their armed forces to interoperate. And I think the enhanced forward presence that I've championed actually for seven years uh, since the Crimean occupation is a good testament to that. But we need to go further, we need to go quicker, we need to innovate, we need to standardize, we need to share equipment. I think the Ukrainian support missions this year have demonstrated that, where weapon calibers need to be harmonized, where aeroplanes, ships, and soldiers need to be able to work together. Obvious points that needed now more than ever. And then of course, the second issue for NATO is precisely the opposite of what the Russians may have intended. If I make the strategic assumption that Finland and Sweden will join NATO, then that gives a very different set of geographic opportunity and consequence to all of you in your region. And I think we should grab that. Um, the UK is proud to lead the Joint Expeditionary Force, Sweden and Finland are members. And through that process, we've already enhanced the interoperability of UK forces with Sweden and Finland over the last few years along with other Joint Expedition Force members. And I think NATO is a further example to that. And of course, Finland and Sweden have very distinct and important capabilities. And I, I don't know how many academics want you to argue with me, but I'm pretty sure that um, Putin did not attempt, President Putin did not attempt in February 24th this year to have Finland and Sweden joining NATO as a consequence 
of that special military operation or illegal war, as I prefer to call it. So I think these are challenging times. We need to stick together with our allies and friends, whether they're through good organizations like the Joint Expeditionary Force, treaty-based organizations with form and substance, such as the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, and anybody, anybody, whichever nationality they, ha they hold that now thinks in Europe, that Europe is stronger without NATO, I don't think that conversation needs to be, to, to be had for very long. And so strategic autonomy now, to me personally, not because I'm British, but because I have um, served in NATO. Uh, by the way, I've served in NATO seven times uh, since the 1970s. Strategic autonomy for me means making NATO more interoperable, more ready, more willing, and able to take political military decisions, military strategic decisions, and then execute them through a plan and an operation. And that is the strength of the Alliance. And the last quote I'd offer you, and it's not a particularly academic one, is General Eisenhower on the formation of NATO remarked at one of the very first meetings, the plan is nothing, planning is everything. So in groups like this, whether they're informal, beyond the boundaries of the discussions on Kaliningrad, the Baltic, planning is everything. And we need to work together now more than ever. Thank you. And I'm very happy to join the debate. I haven't talked that much about Kaliningrad. Many of you will be aware there's a lot of equipment there. Um, how ready it is, how serviceable it is, how available it is. Those are questions that others can probably comment better than me. Thank you. Stuart, that's really excellent. Thank you very, very much indeed. It's exactly what we were hoping as a, uh, an insight into that situation. Now, we've had a number of people, uh, participants, raising questions, interesting questions. I'm going to take a couple, first of all, which relate directly to what you've been saying, partly what you've just been saying, Stuart, but also the others as well. I'm going to read out the two questions and ask the three of you, starting with Stefan, to respond. Stephen Evans from Durham University asks, is Kaliningrad a strategic asset for Russia, given that it's an unsinkable aircraft carrier, to quote Stefan? Or is it a liability requiring forces to be allocated to its defense to deter any perceived threat from NATO? How should we see it? And the, the second uh, relatively related question from Adam Faraday um, uh, directly addresses the question, the point that Stuart makes. Uh, I would be interested to know how the deterioration of its military assets in Ukraine will affect Russia's posture in Kaliningrad and the Baltic region. The 11th Army Corps, Kaliningrad's principal ground formation, is reported to have been heavily degraded fighting in Kharkiv. So I'm going to take those two questions and Stefan ask you to kick, kick off as you were mentioned in the first question. And then I'll go around Carl and then Stuart for your comments on those two questions. So Stefan first. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think it's, it's both. And um, I think the ability of Russia to play it one way or the other really will depend on the uh, next developments in uh, Ukraine. Um, I think we have seen a general decline of Russian influence in um, what, what you called so cunningly uh, the areas in which Russia is surrounded by ceasefires. Uh, over the um, even past two weeks. Um, I mean, there has been an escalation in, uh, in the South Caucasus, um, where Azerbaijan now had absolutely no qualms uh, to move into areas that should have been protected uh, by Russian uh, peacekeepers. Uh, we have seen that Russia has had absolutely no um, ability to do much about the um, serious escalation in, uh, in the border area between Kyrgyzstan and uh, uh, Tajikistan. Um, so I really think that um, the question of Kaliningrad as a liability is, is a very real one. Whether I would necessarily probe too deeply into that and see um, what um, Russia may or may not be doing in response. I think that's a, that's a different uh, question. So I think it's one more headache uh, for Putin that he probably doesn't, uh, doesn't need. 
but by the same token, he is not prone necessarily, at least from my perspective, to either restraint or rational decision making. So um, he may very well do something that um, uh, could have rather disastrous uh, uh, consequences if it isn't um, played right uh, on our end. Thank you. Carl, do you have any comment on these two questions? Well, yeah, of course, when I, uh, I will be talking about military matters, then uh, maybe uh, Sir Peach will, will correct me if, I, if I, uh, I'm wrong. But, but I, can, I, I can comment from the uh, Estonian point of view and what the Estonian military has, has commented publicly. So, so uh, uh, for example, the uh, elite uh, 60, 67, uh, 6, uh, 76 uh, airborne division has also been destroyed in Ukraine in the, in the very uh, first days of the fighting. Uh, and and that, that's a, a, a big uh, relief for, for, for the Estonians. Uh, so, and it takes, definitely takes uh, several years to, to recover. From, from that disaster uh, for Russia. But uh, I, I think uh, as far as I can see, Estonian military is, 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 is not counting on that, but uh, actually is upgrading our uh, defense systems uh, pretty heavily. For example, uh, we are now uh, buying uh, uh, air defense systems so that we can uh, actually bring down uh, Russian aircraft and, and, and even rockets because we have been very concerned about uh, rockets coming, especially from Kaliningrad. And, um, and the Kaliningrad uh, ha has been a major problem for us uh, strategically because uh, it, it, uh, Russians can uh, cover the, the Baltic Sea. So the sea lines uh, over the Baltic uh, are, are, are threatened from Kaliningrad. And, and there is, has also been the talk about the Suvalki gap, uh, so that uh, the fear is that Russia can actually close this uh, land strip connecting us to Europe. But then again, uh, military analysts have pointed out that it's, it's actually really difficult to close that uh, Suvalki gap uh, 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 with a, through a militarily. It, 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 it needs, it would be a major operation. So uh, the so-called unsinkable aircraft uh, carrier uh, can actually become a problem uh, for, for Russia. It can be encircled and uh, not that it, uh, so, uh, mm, uh, but perhaps uh, Sir Peach will talk after me. So maybe he, he can correct us, correct me. And of course, Sweden and Finland joining NATO would, would change the situation uh, quite dramatic, dramatically also uh, in terms of uh, controlling the, the Baltic Sea. Thank you very much, Carl. Stuart, do you have a, a comment on these two questions? Yes, it's a fair question. And I agree with the professor that it's both. But of course, the Sweden and Finland point is a really big one. And we have to digest this as well as necessarily perhaps not say too much about capabilities. But I would observe in a geopolitical way, Charles, that we are in the missile age. And we sometimes struggle to understand fully what that means. And so when, before Ukraine exposed the reality of the Russian armed forces, there was a tendency to believe that the forward defense of posture in Kaliningrad gave this huge advantage, which was almost invincible. And the fact is, with most missiles, with most missiles, they can be countered or they can be deterred. And so one of the things I think we ought to be doing now in both the strategic setting in NATO and beyond, and in these sort of groups such as yours, Charles, is thinking about deterrence in a wider way. And I think the year has made that clear. Whether it's energy security and all the consequences that's bringing to Europe, or whether it's food security and the consequences that's bringing to Africa. And I think some of those consequences will play out this week at the General Assembly in New York. But specifically on military things and specifically on Kaliningrad, to stick to the question, 
The missiles need to be understood, so you need good intelligence. And then you need to develop counters, so you need good technology. And those counters may not be the obvious ones because they may embrace tactics and techniques that are not just as obvious as shooting them down. And so it's a really important time for militaries, whether they're in the region we're here represented or beyond, to use the innovative st strategy that NATO has adopted at the summit this year and develop new capabilities quickly to reflect the missile age we're in so that we can actually counter both through deterrence and if necessary, defend ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and the next question I'm going to take was actually the first that was asked from Carl Islam, who describes himself as a barrister and mediator. Um, and he, he asked the question, what is the strategic importance and relationship between one, NATO defending the Suwalki corridor, and two, Ukraine recapturing territory on its border with Belarus and Russia? Is there any, are these two strategic objectives joined at the hip? In a sense, that's been answered already by people who've, all three of you have commented on the relationship between what Ukraine is doing, what's happening in Kaliningrad and the Baltic. But is there anything any of the three of you would like to add in response to Carl Islam's question? Stuart? Uh, yes, I was just trying to find the raise hand button. I, I think um, to be a little bit old fashioned, the, the key distinction to the good question is Article 5. NATO territory is, is understood by Russia to be what it is, whereas, of course, Ukraine is not a member of NATO. And Article 5 is and has been since 1949 the serious discriminator between the North Atlantic Treaty Organization and all other forms of military coalitions alliances and friendships. And I therefore think that makes the difference. And my view, and I am the age I am, uh, and I'm happy to be wrong most of the time, but on, on this subject, I think the Russians understand Article 5. And so, and of course, as, uh, some, as, the, as, the, as the professor said, the, the Svalky Gap territories is, is in any way difficult to take. Which leads me to a final comment is I've been struck this year um, throughout the period since 24th February of how little <coughs> proper debate there's been about the maritime dimension. Whether it's the Black Sea, the Baltic Sea, the Mediterranean Sea and all the other seas, because actually the maritime dimension in most major wars and most major conflicts in history have been, has been really, really important. And I think perhaps for think tanks and professors and others that, that this needs more attention. Uh, because the media inevitably, rightly, because of the tragedy in Ukraine, has been focused on the land war. But that's more of an aside. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, following the symposium we had last March, uh, we've got a book uh, coming out on the symposium about the Baltic area, and we have got a chapter in that specifically on the maritime dimension of security in the Baltic Sea, which is very interesting. Uh, Carol or uh, Stefan, would you like to add anything to what Stuart said on this area? No. Okay. So we'll go to the other question. We've still got two or three questions coming down the line, but to ask more if you want. Donatus Kupsiunas, our very own Donatus from our centre, says, how do you see Lithuania's attempt to use the opportunity of Russo-Ukrainian war to get rid of transit between Kaliningrad and mainland Russia? through Lithuanian territory. This was a big dramatic issue on the BBC and elsewhere um, a couple of months ago. And there's been a lot of discussion about was Lithuania simply enforcing the EU's decision, decision on sanctions on Russia, or was it trying to do more or whatever? Stefan, could you kick us off in answering this question about the Lithuania-Kaliningrad relationship and the um, the uh, way in which that's been handled and how it relates to the EU sanctions against Russia on Ukraine. Well, um, let me preface that by saying that I'm an academic uh, with um, very little exposure to the real world. Uh, so I leave my office occasionally, but I cannot claim any 
deep insights uh, into what policymakers, um, be it in Lithuania, be it uh, anywhere else in, in Europe or in Russia for that matter, were actually thinking uh, on this. It's probably not the way in which I would have handled uh, that. Um, by the same token, I also think that a lot of the reporting in the media, as I understood it, was not entirely accurate. Um, so it wasn't, as far as I know, a complete blockade um, of um, all traffic. Uh, there were questions raised in terms of what was actually being sent from Russia uh, uh, to um, uh, uh, to Kaliningrad and the extent to which that may or may not compromise um, uh, EU uh, sanctions, which I think at the time we were in the fourth or the fifth uh, sanctions uh, uh, package. So, I mean, these things have also changed uh, over time. Um, yeah, I, th I think I, I I leave it at that. It's um, it's yeah, I I didn't think it was particularly helpful at the time, um, but on the other hand, I mean, it does send signals, um, well, east and west, north and south, uh, uh, if you want, um, and sometimes this kind of signaling signaling is also important in terms of what may or may not happen um, if. Um, or what may and may not be possible, uh, uh, even um, if there was a more serious escalation. Thank you. Carol, would you like to comment on this particular situation? Mm, I'm afraid I'm an academic with even, even less uh, uh, relationship to, to reality than, <laughs> than Steph Stefan. Uh, well, just to note that uh, Lithuania established uh, quite friendly relations with, with Russia in, in, in early 90s, based on the understanding that there was a transit through Lithuania. And the Soviet uh, troops left Lithuania earlier than, than Latvia and Estonia, based on that understanding that Lithuania also doesn't have a, 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 a large Russian minority, so relations were better than with Latvia and Estonia. And I, I, I don't think and the, also that Kaliningrad has almost a million people, so you, you cannot blockade the region or, or just uh, think uh, that uh, um, you can somehow um, uh, uh, take it over from Russia or something. This, this would be a completely wishful thinking. It, 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 uh, uh, yeah, but that's, a, that's only a, 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 like, a, like a side note. Okay, Stuart, anything you'd like to add about that? Well, I mean, the question really is should be better answered by, of course, by the Lithuanian government. But I am aware that these are uh, agreements that have been very carefully thought through, and the stipulations within would have been thought through in great detail, both when they were drafted and in the enactment subsequently. And of course, the sanctions regimes and packages have changed over the last few months as well. So it's quite a fast moving situation. But nonetheless, I think that the, the points that both the professors have made are really powerful because it's about signaling. It's about understanding the law based framework, however loosely that is defined by international law. And in my long military experience of almost 50 years, there is always a law based framework around somewhere, whether it's at sea, in the air or on the ground through treaties and custom customary practice. And all of that needs to be well understood by senior commanders. And it is, generally. So it is a, a more of a legal question of interpretation. Of course, then there's a whole culture point, which is wrapped in the, the original question, which is about the, the legalistic nature of certain regimes. And so I think that is a, a, that's a fair challenge for a group such as yours, Charles, to, to wonder whether that now needs to be thought through and reset because for many years it's been a sort of well-known trope in Europe that Russia tends to read the text of these treaties very carefully and, and, and know the detail. And I wonder now whether with what we've seen in Crimea, what we've seen with the illegal war in Ukraine, whether that's now valid and whether we need to do some more um, thinking on this in your format and others. I think it is a very good question.
but the, the specific detail is obviously for the Lithuanian government to comment on. Thank you very much. Um, further question on a dimension from a different dimension, China. Uh, you said, Stefan, in your earlier presentation, uh, you talked about the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meetings last week um, and the Xi's visit to Kazakhstan. The question is from Adam Svensson. Do you think there is greater Russian interest in its Western areas, including Kaliningrad, particularly if the argument is made that China is also increasingly looking westwards with its Belt and Road initiatives and any westward expansion in terms of Chinese spread of influence and people? I'll go first to you on this, Stefan, as you mentioned the Shanghai Cooperation Organization meeting your presentation, and then I'll ask Carol and Stuart if there's anything they'd like to add. So, Stefan, uh, what do you think about this? That warrants an entire uh, uh, additional uh, uh, seminar on your part, uh, Charles. Um, I mean, the way I read the uh, uh, situation at the moment is that, um, I mean, Russia is clearly now at best a junior partner. Uh, to um, China and one that um, China does not necessarily always see as particularly reliable or fun to have um, as a junior partner. Um, that has partly to do with the fact that, I mean, the war in Ukraine and all the Western sanctions against Russia, um, they do have an impact on the Chinese economy, but they also have an impact on uh, the Belt and Road Initiative um, and transport routes through Central Asia and Russia and then Belarus and including also into Kaliningrad, they simply don't work anymore. Um, so um, that, that has been a real problem uh, uh, for China. Um, does that push Russia to look more West? Well, I think the fact that China is now clearly the either already predominant or definitely emerging predominant power in Central Asia, um, I think would suggest something like that. Is China doing the pushing here or is Putin choosing to, you know, realize whatever imperial dreams he has now more um, to the west of Russia than, than to the east. There, I would say, I, I cannot necessarily see much of an advantage for China in prolonging um, the well, basically global instability that, that has followed from um, the Ukrainian war. Um, so, I mean, I'm not a China optimist um, necessarily, but I also am not a hardline China skeptic. So I do still think that China overall prefers stability. So I think in that sense, Putin, I think, will increasingly find himself um, isolated and not loved even by those who he might have uh, a degree of uh, ideological affinity with. Thank you. Stuart, what's your comment on the impact of China's behaviour on Russia in this sign overall? I think the professor's analysis was very, um, very important, actually, and I agree with him. So firstly, the terms of trade have changed and that all the deals, whether they're known or unknown, and we don't know a lot of the details of some of them, are often on China's terms. Whereas I think this um, One Belt, One Road initiative is becoming one debt, one road. And I think that actually many of the countries between are becoming quite wary of both Russia and China. Now, I'm not an expert on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and obviously I'm not, uh, wouldn't be welcome to, to observe it in action. But I just feel there's a wariness in those Central Asian states to both the, the history they have with Russia as an empire, and of course now the Chinese experience as China's all the things that the professor said. And the other observation I make from a military perspective is the modernization 
of the People's Liberation Army is quite remarkable when you're an analyst looking at the raw data of the number of ships, airplanes, tanks, soldiers, etc. But do remember, everyone, that China has no military experience whatsoever, other than some now modest experience of UN peacekeeping. And so the terms of trade on the military side are now in a very different place. And it would be very interesting, Charles, to have a seminar on what lessons the PLA take from Russia's war in Ukraine. But it's a very moving, it's a moving situation now. And I think some of the older ways we commented on the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, some of the assumptions we may make about that part of the world, I think need to be really quite carefully looked at. But it's a great Thank question. You. Thank you. It's a very important cautionary note. Carl, anything you'd like to say about the Chinese dimension of this? Not, not really. I, would, I wouldn't add, add anything. OK, um, we've got a further question from Hugo Bromley. Uh, from a historical perspective, he asks, why do you think this moment is one in which neutrality is impossible in the Baltic Sea region? Should we be holding out an ambition of neutrality? Is that a sensible way to go? Just at the time when Finland and Sweden have uh, abandoned neutrality. Uh, do you think uh, neutrality is impossible in the Baltic Sea region at this time? Carol, let me ask you that question first. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, actually, uh, that's a very, very interesting question. And, and uh, is, is neutrality dead? Uh, well, Switzerland, Switzerland actually has shown that it's not yet uh, a dead uh, concept. Uh, but as to Finland and Sweden, uh, it's, it is a misconception that uh, they have been neutral because since uh, joining the EU, they, they, they aren't, haven't been uh, neutral in, in a strict uh, sense because uh, the EU, EU requires member states to, to actually support or, or at least social solidarity for, for any member. Uh, let's say being uh, attacked by, by, by a third country and, uh, and they, they uh, neither Finland nor, nor Sweden uh, uh, when they joined the EU uh, did not uh, add any, any uh, clauses uh, to that saying that you know we, we are neutral so they are actually their understanding has been that they are not, not neutral, but let's say military non-aligned or, or, or something like, like that. Uh, but uh, so I think neutrality as, as a, in general is not over, but uh, obviously uh, probably it is over in, in the Baltic Sea, sea region uh, when uh, Finland and Sweden can join and hopefully they, they can. Uh, and it, and it, it is uh, really a, a major uh, turn in, in Swedish and Finnish uh, foreign policies. Uh, it is a major, major turn. Uh, maybe the last uh, such a big transformation was in, in the early 90s when Finland uh, uh, changed its uh, treaty with the Soviet Union. And, and, uh, uh, so to say, uh, turn towards uh, the West, and and uh, but now it's it's another big big turn in in the in their foreign foreign policies. Thank you, Carl. How do you see the question of neutrality now, Stefan? How do you, what do you think it uh, it is? Do you think it exists? Well, I think you can't really be neutral and safe if you have a border with Russia. Um, I think it's okay for Switzerland uh, to be neutral. Um, I think it's okay for Austria uh, to be neutral. But I can totally understand the, the worries that, uh, that Finland has. And I also completely understand why neutrality really wasn't an option uh, for Ukraine um, to get 
well, basically as a response to, to the Russian uh, uh, blackmail. Um, nor, I mean, if you look at it, um, has it really helped Moldova, um, where the Russian demand um, always was um, constitutionally established neutrality of Moldova will be the key to resolving the conflict in Transnistria. And the constitutional neutrality of Moldova has been established since, um, well, whenever they had their constitution in 1990 or 1991 or something like that. So I think in that sense, um, I think that has always been a red herring in many of the discussions um, because on neither side, it really would have been the rock solid guarantee that, that either would have required. Um, and if you look at more historically um, the fate that uh, some uh, neutral countries uh, have had, um, I mean, Belgian neutrality was uh, violated twice in each uh, world war. So uh, I think from, from that perspective, it's, it's really difficult to see what role um, neutrality as a security arrangement um, can still play. If I may add one thought on this, um, what I a little bit regret in all of this is um, that we are losing what used to be sort of non-aligned countries where sort of there's a bit of a, um, a conceptual fluidity uh, between neutrality and non-alignment. Uh, um, and I mean, to some extent, countries like, like Finland and Sweden and Austria and Switzerland, in the past, they could play that role of um, sort of an ever so slightly more independent, more neutral in inverted commas, uh, uh, go between, um, between, you know, Russia and the West or uh, um, sort of, I mean, even on, on, on less uh, uh, pronounced uh, geopolitical conflicts. And I think, if we are losing that now, and if the world becomes more deeply divided um, and these divisions become more deeply entrenched, uh, I think that also will have longer term geopolitical consequences that um, I don't necessarily think are good. Okay. Stuart, neutrality in NATO, how does that sound to you? No, I think that it's a very good question. And of course, Finland and Sweden were both heavily armed neutral countries, Finland in particular, particular perhaps, and both have pursued a concept of total defense, which is a very interesting concept with many layers and many elements of society involved in that process. And of course, uh, I think five years ago, Sweden reintroduced conscription to no real public drama. And then of course, three years ago, Sweden put armed forces back onto Gotland so I think the, the neutral doesn't mean the same as defenseless. But I agree with the professors that the, the concept is not necessarily changing, but there's a lot changing in the world. I think the, 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 the raising of the non-aligned movement is interesting because, of course, the, one of the most interesting and perhaps surprising things about the year following Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the illegal war, has been the way in which many African countries and other countries have perhaps been less willing to condemn Russia. And of course, many of the origins of the non-aligned movement, famously um, enabled often by Marshal Tito in Yugoslavia, were about the sort of finding this middle ground between the two blocks during the Cold War. So I think this is a very interesting debate. Again, let's just say at the bigger level, the strategic level, or even perhaps the grand strategic level, if that exists, the, the arms control framework, which was so painstakingly created in the 80s and 90s, has been abrogated by Russia on all counts, virtually, and there's very little left. The neutrality framework, if that's a framework, is also fraying. And so maybe there is a bigger question here. And we seem to be doing this in Charles we seem to be creating lots of topics for further discussion. Good, it's good, a very good. interesting question. Thank you very much. I'm delighted there's lots of topics for future discussion. That's exactly what we need. Um, now, um, we've just about finished. I've got one quick question, which I think nobody's going to answer, be able to answer, but I'll nevertheless 
give you the chance because it's quite a technical question. It's from Michael Simmons, and he says, if Finland joins NATO, how might this affect the situation of the Holland Islands, uh, those islands off the coast? Does anybody have a, any clue as to how to answer this question? Aha, Stefan, thank you. I have an answer to it, whether it is necessarily the answer or a correct answer, I think that's different. Um, um, I don't think it should affect uh, uh, the status of the Orland Islands because that goes back to a League of Nations uh, settlement in 1921 uh, in which um, uh, the uh, demilitarization uh, of the Orland Islands uh, was uh, agreed. Um, so I don't think one would be able to put um, well military base uh, on any one of the 26,000 islands or so that actually make up the, the Orland Islands uh, um, archipelago, I think is the uh, correct uh, term here. Um, but I also don't think that that's necessarily a major issue. Again, what is problematic here is um, the extent to which the Orland Islands actually can continue to serve as a potential model. Uh, for resolving um, some of the um, many conflicts that we have sort of uh, across Europe, uh, uh, Eurasia and, and elsewhere, um, where they were always um, sort of um, put on uh, um, a pedestal and, and said, well, look at, you know, how well uh, everybody has uh, responded to the Orland settlement. And a lot of people would say to me, yes, of course, they would love to be part of Finland. Um, if they, uh, if that was the price for adopting uh, the Orland model. Thank you. Um, well, I'm delighted we had that level of expertise to be able to answer that question at that stage. Carl or Stuart, do you have anything to say on the Orland Islands? No? Uh, okay, well, I would now like to say we've come to the end of this video panel on, on the geopolitics of Kaliningrad. Personally, I think it's been a fantastic session. I think it's really been an interesting set of exchanges. I'm sorry that Raimondus missed it, uh, and we, he can look at it after the event, but I thought that it really was very good. And so I want to thank, first of all, the three of you as panelists, you were outstanding and helpful in all of it. So thank you very, very much indeed. I want to thank the audience for coming, uh, which I think has been excellent as well, and good questions we've had. And to remind you that you'll soon be able to find a recording of this event on our website. And please do sign up to the website to receive regular information. Good evening and thanks for being with us.